How you all doing today? You good? Yeah? You sure? Yeah, so over the next three weeks, it's, it's a bit of a um, lolly scramble of messages over the next three weeks, and, um, and then we're going to get into a, a series. I really feel like God speak to me in the middle of um, our Happy Place series to do a, a series on the miracles of Jesus. How many people think that's a good idea? I think we need anything happening in our world right now. It's the miracles of Jesus, yes? And so um, we're going to do a whole series on his miracles, not all of them, but some of them, and and hopefully, uh, not hopefully, I'm believing that as we do this series of miracles that you're going to see miracles happen in your world, yeah? Yes? Cool, awesome. Um, hey, uh, I have, um, for those that don't know me, my name's Craig, and, and I grew up in church. Like, I didn't grow up in a home, I grew up in the church because my parents were pastors, and so... I slept at the church, ate at the church, went to toilet at the church. Like, I just lived at the church all the time. And seven days a week, all the time, um, I had plenty of Sunday nights sleeping under the seats, counting the amount of um, chewing gum that people had stuck under there. You're all really serious this morning. Um, Stuck under there, and just like, it was just... I, and so, just a side note, parents, don't, don't do this. Oh, well, they've got school tomorrow, so I'm not going to bring them out. The best place you could have your kids is in the house of God, in his presence. And you know what? If they're a little bit tired the next day and a little bit difficult to deal with, get over yourself. Don't be selfish and thinking about what you want the next day. Think about them growing up in the house of God and experiencing his presence. And, and I'm telling you, it didn't hurt my kids. It didn't hurt me and it won't hurt your kids either. Just a little side note there for you. And, um, but I grew up in it. And so I was there seven days a week all the time. Um, and, and it was like, you know, we would go to church on a Sunday morning, then go out for lunch and then be back for Holy Ghost Church on a Sunday night. Who remembers those days? Yeah, not this one service on a Sunday thing, but, you know, two services on a Sunday, Holy Ghost night, sleeping. Um, it was a little bit easy, I suppose, for my dad because he would pick us up while we are sleeping and he'd just lie us in the back because we had a, a, a Valiant station wagon. Who remembers Valiant's? Don't make him like that anymore. Our station where he just liars in the back because you didn't have to worry about seatbelts or anything like that back in those days because we wanted our kids to die in car crashes. Um, so, um, so, you know, it was a little bit easier for him, but, but you know, it was such a, a good thing for me. And I grew up in it and I was there week in, week out. But what I learned growing up in church and what I've learned even pastoring is that we have to be really, really careful that we don't get lost so lost in doing church that we stop being the church. That we can get so lost in doing the whole church thing that we fail to actually be the church that God created us to be. And God created the church. God invented the church. It's God's idea to have the church. And so for you to understand a little bit what it means, and some of you would have heard this before, but the word in, in Scripture that that describes what the church is, is the word ecclesia. It's a, it's a Greek word because the New Testament was written in Greek originally. And so when you go back to the original text, it's the word ecclesia. And the word ecclesia means when people gather for a purpose. And so we are not the church individually so much as when we come together as the church, we become the church as we gather together for a similar purpose. And, and so God has created it. He's decided that the way that he wants it to be is that we gather together. And so church is not so much about where you are, but about who you're with. Isn't that cool? It's about who you're with, which means that you can have church anywhere when you gather together. You can have church at the beach. You can have church at McDonald's, KFC. (laughs) Nando's. Yeah, there we go. Um, And we can have all those things, but... God, all the way through Scripture, talks about the church, and I want to I hopefully explain to you what church is this morning so that you get a real foundation of understanding what the church is, what, what is the responsibility of the church, why is it important for us to be the church, and, and I'm going to share with you out of uh, Ephesians chapter 5, there's a, there's a bunch of Scriptures there, 
which usually people use in regards to marriage and all that sort of stuff. But when you see the scripture, you actually realize that, that Paul at this time of writing, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is talking about marriage, but he's actually talking about the church. He's using marriage as an example of what the relationship should be between us, the church, and Jesus, our Saviour. And so it starts off, and I know it's a little controversial, and, and some of you are probably going to get a little bit like, <clears throat> as, as soon as we start, because it starts with this, wives, submit to your husbands. There's, there's, there's a couple of guys that are brave enough to aim in that. <laughs> wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church his body, of which he is the saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless." In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their own body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his mother and father and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now, all of that, is to say this last sentence. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. He's not talking about marriage. He's using marriage as an example of what the relationship should be between Christ and the church. So what is the, what is the three responsibilities for the church, the gathering, us in this room? The first thing that Scripture teaches us is that our First and foremost responsibility that we have as a church is to minister to God. Did you know that? That's, that's the prime number one responsibility of you and I is that we would minister to God. You, you need to get this in your spirit because we think our prime responsibility is to do what he tells us to do, but the prime responsibility of the church is to minister to God. The incense that used to burn day and night in the temple of the Old Testament, you are that incense now that burns day and night and is a sweet smell in his nostrils. You, me, when we come together, our number one responsibility is to minister to God. And that's why we always start with praise and worship in our service, not because we, we feel like having a concert. No, 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 it's a concert to God, not a concert to us. It's, a, it's an opportunity for us to come and minister to Him. The Bible says that, that it brings joy to His heart as we praise and we worship Him and we magnify Him and we glorify Him and we praise Him for all that He is. In fact, you may have had an incredibly tough week, but when you come through the door and you put that aside and you give Him the praise and the worship that He deserves, all of a sudden gets God's attention. God responds to that, but our prime responsibility as the church is to minister to God. It's to praise Him. It's to bless Him. And when we do that, things start to shift. Psalms 34 verse 3 says this, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His holy name. I don't know about you, but I, when I come here together and we gather together on a Sunday, I want to magnify Him. I want to bless Him. I want to praise His holy name. Why? Because whatever you magnify increases in size in your world. So my question is, what are you magnifying today? The Savior or your problem? The answer or the issue? Because whatever you magnify increases in size in your world. And that's why the prime responsibility of the church is to come and minister to Him and magnify Him because it increases the size of God in our world and the worlds of those around us. 
One or two people are in agreement this morning. It's awesome. The second thing that we're meant to do as a church is we're meant to minister to others. We're meant to do ministry to others. And so we don't just have me up here preaching or somebody else up here preaching for the sake of it. We have people up here doing it because the Bible says that there's power in our preaching, that there's power in the Word of God. You see, the cross is foolishness to them who don't believe, but to us who are being saved, the Bible says that it is the power of God, that the message of Christ is the power of God to those who know Him, to those that are following Him, to those that are saved and following Him as their Lord and Saviour. The message, the gospel, the preaching is the power of God unto us. And so, so the whole thing is, is what we don't just do stuff for the heck of it, or I don't get up here and talk because it makes me feel good because you're all looking at me and giving your attention. We're doing it because it's the power of God unto our lives. It's the Word of God. It's about God's love. And the cool thing about all of this is that it doesn't matter where you are on your journey with God, we can all be at different stages. But the crazy thing about God is that as somebody ministers and preaches from the front, we all get something from it depending on where we are and what works what, what you get out of this message this morning will be different to what Rimmer gets out of it. Why? Because we're all on a different stage, but God has this ability that after we come and magnify Him and glorify Him and minister Him, He allows through the preaching of the Word to minister to you exactly where you are. Isn't He a good God? He's a great God. He speaks to us as the word is given. And the third area that we're meant to do as a church is we're meant to minister to the world. You see, we gather on Sunday, but we're meant to scatter on Monday. We gather on Sunday to be the church, but we're meant to scatter Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and we're meant to be the church in our workplace, be the church in our school place, be the church in our neighbourhood, be the church in our community. We gather here on Sunday so that we can be the church Monday to Saturday because we're meant to minister to others. And it was Jesus that said, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I, I love that scripture because it, it speaks to me that God's intention for us as a church is to be progressive, to be aggressive, to constantly be moving forward and taking ground and advancing the kingdom, that, that we have the great privilege, according to what Jesus said, that we have the great privilege of rescuing people from hell and helping them move over into the kingdom of God, yes? Yes. It's a great privilege that God gives us and it's the threefold ministry of the church is first to minister to God, to one, to minister to others and then to minister to our world. And we have to step out into the world and minister to it and rescue people. Why? Because whatever we avoid, the devil will invade. Whatever we, whatever we avoid, whatever we fail to take ground in, he will take ground in. Whatever we leave empty, he will come and fill the space. In fact, we see that through Scripture, don't we, where it says, don't, don't pray and, for somebody and, and get them, you know, cast out demons and stuff like that in them and leave them an a empty, clean house because the enemy will come back and he'll see. And, and if Jesus isn't filling that space, he'll bring seven of his mates back with him and he'll be worse off than when you first prayed for him. Why? Because whatever we fail to, to occupy ourselves, he will invade that space. So we can't avoid some of the things out there today. We can't avoid some of the conversations that we need to have and, and we need to do that in a good way and a right way and the kind of way that Jesus did it, which was never in your face and never offensive towards a sinner. He was only ever offensive towards the religious people of the day because they were offensive to him. And so we need to do it right, but we can't avoid Conversations, we can't avoid areas because whatever we avoid, the devil will invade and we, we shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't be ashamed. We should be bold. We should be courageous. We should step out and let the light of Jesus shine into every situation we come in contact with. You see, when it comes to the Ecclesia, all the way through Scripture, there's all these different metaphors uh, of what the church is. In fact, the Apostle Paul has a few. 
He talks about the, the church being like a body and everybody has its part to play. Some are the little finger, some are the thumb, some, some's a thigh, some are an appendix. Nobody knows what they do, but they have the potential to blow up and kill all of us. Some of us are the tongue, some of us are eyes, some of us are noses. He talks about, it's a metaphor. He's not saying you're literally a nose. He's just using it as a metaphor to describe what the kingdom of God is. And another thing that he talks about in there is he talks about us being living stones. I don't know about you, but if you've picked up a brick lately, it doesn't talk back to you. It's not alive, it's not living. He's using it as a metaphor to suggest that we are living stones and when we come together and we build together, we become a house for the Lord to inhabit. We become a home for Him to come into. That's why the Bible says we're two or three are gathered in my name. I am there in the midst. And it doesn't mean there in the midst. It means that He literally comes and builds His house in the middle of that gathering. So metaphors are used all the way through Scripture in describing the church, but the most peculiar one is the one that I just mentioned where he uses, talks about marriage and he talks about the church being the bride of Christ. I've, I've always found it interesting and probably a little bit weird that we're called the bride of Christ. I mean, have you ever wondered about that? I mean, for example, um, my beautiful wife Trinity is here today. Um, Incredibly beautiful woman sitting in the front row. I thought I would have got something there, darling. I'm working here. Um, we've been together for 31 years, and 29 of those we've been married, and uh, we, we dated and stuff for, I think, six months, and we're engaged for 18 months, and then, uh, and then we've been married for 29 years. We've done ministry together. We've done life. We've done everything together. But how crazy would it be if you came up to me and you said, hey, Craig, I, I really like you. I love you, man. You're awesome. But if I'm really honest, Trinity, no, not so much. Don't really like her at all. How many people know that I would probably have an issue with that statement? How many people know that if you went up to Pete and said, Pete, I really like you. You're awesome. But Amanda, ugh. Pete, Pete ain't going to be your friend. I'll be the other way around. Okay, yeah. We really like, it's true, true, it's true. Um, you know, it's like, we really love you, Anna Cooper. You're amazing. But really? Rimmer, really? How many people know that you don't have a problem with someone who did that? Because you can't say you love me and then not love her because the Bible says that the two become one flesh. So you can't say that you think I'm awesome, but you don't like, or you think she's awesome, which is probably the correct thing, but you don't like me very much. It's, it just doesn't work that way, right? Are you hearing me? Yet I know many, many Christians over the years, that say things like this, I love Jesus, just don't like the church. Or they say things like, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Or church is boring. Church is full of hypocrites. Understanding that we are the bride of Christ, I think, that if we have words like that come out of our mouths, I think we probably need to pause for a little bit and just have a little think about what we're actually saying, what we're actually communicating. Because when you understand who we are as the bride of Christ, as the church, as his bride, man, would you really say those things to his face about his bride? I think we need to think about who we are. I don't think you can say you can love Jesus, but I don't like your bride. And look, I understand. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I get it. But here's my question for you. If you love Jesus and you're a Christian, why would you not want to go to church? Why would you not want to be part of the gathering, the bride? Why would you not want to be part of that? If Jesus has said, hey, this is the thing that I love, this is the thing I laid my life down for, why would you not want to be part of that? 
I don't understand it. I will just, will just watch from home. I don't get that. I don't understand that. I get it if you're sick. I just don't get it for any other reason. I get it if you're away on holiday and you want to watch while you're away on holiday. I just don't get it for any other. Oh, well, it interferes with my kids' sleep time. Our kids slept through church. You see, we taught our kids really early on that church and our spiritual journey doesn't evolve around them. They evolve around our walk. The church, the kingdom of God, the bride of Christ doesn't make adjustments to fit my kids' lifestyle. My kids will make adjustments to fit the lifestyle of the church. So I don't get it. My kids, when they were young, slept in my arms all the way through praise and worship and the preaching. And I'd have to sit down because they were getting a little heavy at times, if you know what I mean. People say things like, church is boring. You know when you say church is boring? You're saying that you're boring. I'm not boring. Hang around with me. I'm quite, I'm quite fun. I'm not boring. You're not boring. We're not boring. Trust me. I grew up in church in the 70s and the 80s. This is not boring. All right? I refuse to be boring. We're not boring. All oh, the church is full of hypocrites. Yes, you're correct. It is full of hypocrites. That's why we come to church, because we're in need of a saviour. That's why we're here, because we know we're not perfect and we need Jesus. We need a saviour to come and save us. Yes, the church is full of hypocrites. And guess what? It's okay because Jesus is not a hypocrite. And when he says he'll never leave you nor forsake you, he means it. When he says that he can save you and deliver you, he means it. When he says that he can transform you and heal you and bind up your wounds, he means it. We might be hypocrites, but he is not the hypocrite and he is the head of the church. We're the bride and he's the head. He's the one in charge. And it's okay for us to be hypocrites. It's all right because we tend to say one thing and do something else. But I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful that we serve a God who is not a hypocrite, but I serve a God who has saved us and will always live out what he says in our lives. When Paul said this, he says, the things I don't want to do, I do do, and the things I want to do, I don't do. What's Paul basically saying? I'm a hypocrite. That's what he's saying in that moment but I need a saviour. You know, I don't come to church to be reminded of my weaknesses. I come to church to be reminded of his strengths. I come to church to be reminded of his saving power. I come to church to be reminded of his grace and his mercy and his goodness towards me. That's why as soon as the musicians begin to play, I don't have to be warmed up in my seat to respond because I come in through the doors understanding that I am here gathered with people, bride of Christ, and I'm so thankful that he saved me. I'm so thankful that he delivered me. I'm so thankful that he is for me and not against me. I'm so thankful that he blesses me when I'm coming in and he blesses me when I'm going out. I'm so thankful that he saved me from all the stuff that I could have gone in certain directions in my life and he delivered me from it. And so it's not hard to come in and go, this is who I am. This is my responsibility. I'm going to minister to God this morning. Because it's who he is. My God's not a hypocrite. My God provides me with the grace so I can walk out the race set before me. So let me give you reasons from the scripture that I read out earlier as to why I believe we're called the bride of Christ because it seems a little bit weird that we're called a bride, right? Am I the only one? All right, cool. The first reason Paul says here is he says in the scripture that I read out earlier, it says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. The first reason why we're called the bride of Christ is because God wants intimacy with you and me. Remember, this is a metaphor, not literal. He wants intimacy with you and me. And out of all the things that he could have likened the relationship between him and the church to be, 
He likened it to a bride. And I, and I don't know of a more intimate place on planet Earth than marriage. I, I don't know of anything more intimate in all of the world it, but a marriage bed between a husband and a wife. And, and God is saying, that's the type of relationship I want with my church. Now, maybe you're hearing this and you're kind of getting weirded out now because you're kind of like, I don't feel that comfortable with God romancing me. I'm not really into this whole bride thing. Remember, this is not literal. It's a metaphor. It's God, God is trying to find throughout the earth an example of what he would like his relationship between the church and himself to be. And he decides that marriage is the best example here on earth of what the kind of intimate relationship he would like to have with you and I. Because real intimacy is really all about trust and nothing else. I mean, I, I, I love you all. I, I really do. In fact, if there's something that I really sensed during the worship this morning was just that God loves you. God is so in love with every single person. And, and I, I love you, but how many people know that I love Trinity differently than I love you? How many people are glad that I love her differently than I love you? I am too. And she loves me differently to how she loves you also. So what if what God is trying to say here is not some weird kind of creepo thing, but maybe God's trying to say, hey, I want our relationship to be so intimate that, that, that I show you a love that's different than any other love you've ever received before. That I'm going to love you differently than anybody else has loved you before. What if God is inviting you to know him in a different way, in an intimate way that is full of trust? that you would get to know him in a way that you've never discovered before. See, the problem with, with using relationships, I think, as an example of, of what God's trying to say here is that, is that how many people know that when we date, we project ourselves, and then when we get married, we tend to marry our actual selves. We date our projected selves, but we actually marry our actual selves. You know what I'm saying? Like when you're dating, oh, you love the color blue? I love the color blue too. You love pizza? I love pizza. Like everything when you're dating is just projected. Rom-coms, love me a good rom-com. We should go and watch a rom-com. Usually you're watching Taken 1, 2, and 3 on repeat. But somehow all of a sudden now that you're dating, you're projecting this idea that you love a good rom-com. Or like um, uh, an ex-pastor of mine, he used to love go hunting and, and while he was dating um, Jim and Annika, they'd go out hunting while they're dating, they'd go and hunt and, and she was a really good shot and, and then when they got married, it was like six months into their marriage and he goes, oh, we haven't gone hunting together since we've been married, we should go hunting. And she said, no thanks, you can go, but I'm staying home. And he goes, but I thought you loved hunting. She goes, why we were dating? Now that we're married, I don't need to do it. How many people are like, <gasps> why? Because when we're dating, we project ourselves, but when we get married, we actually discover ourselves. Yes? In fact, I'd suggest to you the first seven, eight years, you're probably lying to each other about who you really are. And then one day you wake up and you go, who is this person I'm married to? They have weird things about them. Yes? They're a scruncher and not a folder. <laughs> Toilet paper. You have some people that scrunch it and other people that fold it. If you're a scruncher, you're not normal. <laughs> some, people, some people like the toilet paper going as a mullet, running down the wall, and other people like it coming <laughs> a beard. All right, see, right there. See? You start to discover things about them that you never knew before. All of a sudden, they become this, this Lego freak. And all they want to do is buy Lego all the time. And they want to fill the house at Christmas time with Christmas Lego. Who is this person? Where did they come from? And then she makes you, when you're in America, makes you go to four different Lego shops 
to look at Lego. I didn't go to one golf store, just so you know. We project ourselves, right? And then when we get married, the real self actually shows up. And here's the, here's the thing. What God's trying to say to us is this. Is he goes, I, I, I'm not interested in a relationship with the projected you. I'm only interested in a relationship with the real you. I don't want the church version of you. I want the real you. One of my sayings that I have a lot um, when I'm talking to different people or talking to different leaders in our church, it's like, how are you going? Good. Is that an honest good or is that a Christian good? I don't want the Christian version of you. I want the honest version of you. God doesn't want the church version of you. He wants the real version of you. And I believe that God causes the bride because he wants to know us and he wants us to know him in an intimate way. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. And Paul continues and says, Christ gave himself up for her that she might be holy and blameless and blemish-free, wrinkle-free, that we would be a pure bride. Isn't that an interesting thing? Because I think a lot of people, when they start talking, this is a side note, start talking about end times as they're saying that God's coming back from a for a pure bride, for one without blemish. But according to this scripture, Ephesians 5, it says that when Jesus laid his life down on the cross, he made the church holy, pure, and without blemish. He's not... Because <laughs> if we think it's about us getting ourselves right for his return, we're in trouble because it's nothing to do with what we do and everything that what he's done. And when he died on the cross, he said, I made the church holy and blameless and without blemish. So the next time one of them end times people tell you that the church has got too much rubbish going on and God won't come back until it's pure and holy, you can just turn around and say to them, um, actually, and Scripture says that we already are. So take you and your dispensationalism somewhere else. Sorry, I touched on end times. You should never do that in church. First reason why we call the bride of Christ is because he wants an intimacy with you. The second reason we're called the church is for protection. For protection. God is saying that the church is protected by Jesus. As you read the text, one of the most controversial parts of the scripture in the Bible is when it says, wives submit to your husbands. Now, side note, I notice it doesn't say women submit to men. And it doesn't say women submit to all husbands, but rather it says women submit to your husband. And I know that there are a lot of women that can get really upset about this part of Scripture where it says wives submit to your husband, but that's because you stop at that point and don't read the next part of the Scripture which says husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. You see, I'm not sure who got the shorter end of the deal because Christ loved his church by dying on the cross. And so it says, wives submit to your husband, but husbands love your wives like Christ loved the church. Women, you have to submit to your husbands. Guess what? Husbands have to die for their wives. Oh, it's gone real quiet now. Girls have to submit. Guys have to die. So the question is this. Ladies, can you be a girl who's worth dying for? And men, can you be a man who's worth submitting to? Oh, it's gone really quiet now. As I don't think there's a woman in this place that wouldn't have a problem submitting to a husband that lays down his life for her. I mean, they have a problem is when you get selfish and you make sure that you get all what you want first and she gets what she wants second. Shall we move on? <laughs> Paul is saying Christ loved the church so much that he died for the church. He died for it. Now, I'm not a fighter, okay? I'm, I've never been a fighter my whole entire life. I've had a smart mouth my whole entire life, which has got me into a lot of fights, but I never won any because I'm not a fighter. I'm, I'm, more of a, I'm more of a lover than a fighter. <laughs> but 
if you attack my wife, you're going to see a fighter. You touch her, you say anything to her, you treat her badly, you and I are going to have a real problem and I'm going to come prepared. Come on, that's why I love the movie Taken so much. You took my daughter, I'm going to kill every single one of you until I get her back. I, oh, I love it. Yeah? Does something to your manliness on the inside of you. If you touch my family, I am ready by any means necessary to step into the middle and protect my wife. She is my responsibility and I'll do anything I need to do, even die for her if I have to. And what you need to understand is that that's how God loves you. That God has on so many occasions stepped into your life, stepped into the gap. Many times where you haven't even seen it, where God has stepped in and taken the blows for you. And I think some of those things you'll never ever know until you get to heaven on the other side of eternity and you'll see, oh, there was his hand, there was his hand, there was his hand, there was his hand. I don't know about you, but if you attack my wife, I'm going to defend her. If you attack the church, God's going to defend it. If you attack the bride, Jesus is going to step in and go, whoa, whoa, hold on a sec. I gave my life, I laid my life down for this thing. He laid his life down for us. It's how much he loves us. That's why when you come to church, you don't have to wait to be warmed up in the praise and worship because when you understand that he gave his life for us, it's just our automatic response is to worship and pray and, and Reach out towards him because you know how many times God has shown up in your life and there are plenty of times that he's showing up when you didn't even realize he's showing up for you because the husband protects the bride. Right smack in the middle of Ephesians 5, Paul gives the gospel. How do we know that God will protect you? Because he already did 2,000 years ago when he came and he walked on this earth and he died a sinner's death for you and I. In fact, he died your death and my death on a cruel cross. He died the death to take the punishment of sin. He took the curse of sin when he died. His life protected you then and his life protects you now. Today, you are called spotless. You are called blameless. You are called righteous, not because of anything that we have done, but because of everything that he has done. You're a spotless, blemish-free bride, and it's called grace because he protected you with his life. We're called the bride because he wants an intimate relationship with you. We're called the bride because he wants to protect you. And the thing about Jesus is that he chose you and he chose me. And here's the thing about Jesus is that he's way out of our league. Yet he chose us anyway. He protected us. And today we are blemish free. We are wrinkle free. We are a spotless bride, not because of what we have done, but because of what he had done and because he chose us. He is completely out of our league, but he chose us to be his bride. And then Paul continues to write, he says, at an appointed time, a man will leave his mother and father and he will unite to a woman and they will become one flesh. He said, this is a profound mystery, but I'm actually talking about Christ and the church. The third reason why we call the bride of Christ is because we become one with him and when we become one with him, we get the same rights as him. We have intimacy, we have protection, but we have the same rights as Jesus, we are co-heirs with Christ. We are seated with him in heavenly places. Paul said this in Romans 8, that if we're willing to share in Christ's suffering, we will also share in his glory. I've got good news for you today. Because of Jesus, when you put your trust and faith in him, all of a sudden you attain the same rights as what he has. Today you are the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. When you pray prayers, like the book of James says, when you pray prayers, the, the, the prayers of a righteous man, which you are righteous because you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, 
So the righteous man, when he prays, his prayers availeth much. Aren't you thankful today that you're not standing in your righteousness, but you're standing in his righteousness and that you have the same rights as Jesus because of what he has done. When you pray, God hears your prayers. You have rights today, the rights of sonship, the rights of daughtership. We have intimacy, we have protection, and we have the rights that Jesus has because of Christ. We are the church. God's calling us to be the church, the God's calling of the church is not what happens inside an hour and a half inside these four walls, but God wants the church to be active in the world around us. And he has given you intimacy. He has given you protection and he has given you the same rights and authority and power. He said, all authority I have on heaven and earth and I give it to you so that you can go out and be a witness in the world around us to be the church at school, to be the church at work, to be the church and pack and save, to be the church in our community. And some of you are going to recognize during this message that if you're really honest with yourself, you're a follower of Jesus and you're attending church, you're actually not actively engaged as the church. You attend, but you're not engaging as the church. I believe God wants to use all of our gifts. I believe that God wants to use all of our prayers. I believe that God wants to use all of our faith. I believe God wants all of us reaching out, inviting people to become followers of Jesus. I believe God wants all of us to be active in his church. I believe God wants all of us to be engaged in life to give a deeply committed community around God's word. And if you're attending, but you're not fully engaged as a church, then I really wanna invite you to step into being the church. Step into the intimacy. Step into the protection. Step into the rights. Why? So that we can minister to him, minister to others, and minister to the world around us. God needs you. God wants you. God died for you so that you could be the bride of Christ that goes out there as one with him, seeing our world transformed for Jesus. That's why we exist. It's what the church is. It's not a social club. It's a transformation club. It's a rescuing club. It's a ministering ministering to God club. It's not a social club. In saying that, you're going to make great friends and you're going to meet other amazing people but we're meant to be the bride. Yeah. Why don't you all close your eyes just for a moment? And if you're here today and you're like, man, I, I come here, but if I'm really honest with myself, I'm not completely engaged. I'm not, I'm not all in yet. But at the same time, maybe you recognize that there's actually more for you, that God has more for you than what you're currently seeing. That God hasn't created you just to go to church to to be of service to Him in the kingdom. God's created you to be His church, represent His love, use your gifts, and make a difference in this world. That's why we exist. That's what the church is. And if you're like, man, I, I really want to take a step this morning to be towards being God's church, towards being His bride, towards using my gifts to make a difference. Then I'm going to ask you very shortly while nobody's looking around of you to lift your hand in a moment and say, you know what, I want to, I want to make that commitment that I'm going to become the bride of Christ. I'm going to use my gifts. I'm going, to, I'm going to represent His love. I'm going to minister to Him. I'm going to minister to others. I'm going to minister to the world around me. I, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how that's going to pan out, but, but I really want to be the bride. I, I understand now that I have intimacy with Him, that I have protection and that I have His rights. And I want to be the most amazing bride. I want Him to be so proud of me as His bride that he boasts about me to everybody around. And if that's you and you're like, man, I really want to fully engage and be the bride of Christ this morning, use my gifts, use my talents any way that I can. 
And you're like, man, I, I, today I want to I re- I fully engage with being His bride, being the church. And I want you to lift up your hand and I'm going I'm to pray for you. If that's you and you're like, man, I really want to fully commit to that today, to being His bride. Just lift your hands in this place. Awesome. 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 Father, you see every single hand that is lifted in this place. You see them because you love them. In fact, you know how many hairs they have on their head. You are so intimately entwined with us that you know everything about us. But God, we choose today to become intimately entwined with you to pursue you with all that we've got. We're gonna minister to you every single day of our lives. We're gonna worship you, we're gonna magnify you. We're gonna be your bride. We're gonna minister to others around us, that you give us opportunity, God, to minister on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, in every conversation that we have, that we have an opportunity to minister to others and and to minister to the world around us. I pray, God, that as they make this commitment, that you would start to stir on the inside of them, that you would would eliminate any inadequacies that they may have, any insecurities that they may have about who they are and not understand that, man, I have... I have intimacy with God. I have protection from Jesus. And I have the same rights as Him as a son and daughter of the Most High. God, I pray that they'd step out with a boldness uh, and love and mercy and grace that would impact not only their lives, but all the lives around them. That as they step in to say, you know what, I'm fully engaged in the kingdom. Lord, that you would just create open door after open door after open door for them. And that any sacrifice that they make to do that, you would reward them, as your Scripture says, 60, 80, and 100 fold. That no one gives up anything that God does not repay. And so God, for those that are in this building right now, that have given up things to serve you, Father, I pray that they'd start to see you blessing them and repaying them for the sacrifice that they have made. But God, may we always understand that He died for us. He loved us so much that He laid down His life to make us blameless, to make us pure right in that moment. And so, Father, we want to be all that You created us to be, the bride of Christ, the church. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.